Hey everyone, welcome to A Great Alternative. In today's video, I've got Dan from the Radnishir Wildlife Trust with me to teach me what a leaky dam is, how to put one in, and why. So, without further ado, no more words from Dan. <laughs> let's just get started. All right, let's do it. <laughs> So Dan, what is a leaky dam? It is a dam that isn't designed to hold back the entirety of the water. It is supposed to allow water through the structure, but it is supposed to slow water down, especially in upland catchments of rivers where we're looking to reduce the flow of water out of these upland catchments to sort of reduce flooding issues further downstream in the lowlands. So they're sometimes called leaky dams. They're also sometimes called leaky woody debris. And that's because depending on where you're doing it, in some places you might be really trying to impound the water. In other places, you might simply just be trying to reintroduce wood into the watercourse in the same way that would happen naturally from tree failure or otherwise from species such as beaver. So wood in our watercourse is actually a really important part of riverine ecology. But for probably the past 100, 200 years, even longer, our method of river management has been to clear the watercourses of woody debris. We're now realising how important that is for both flood management but also for wildlife and ecology. And now all across the country, different river catchments are starting to roll out things like leaky woody debris as well as other natural flood management interventions. And we've come here specifically, not only to show us how to make one, but to see some examples. I see you've got some examples behind you there. Do you want to just talk me through? Yeah so, this is, leaky dam. yeah, so this is a leaky dam, sort of traditional as it is. It's a terminal feature, so it's pretty, pretty robust in that nothing will get past this. There are other leaky dams further upstream. So if they were to fail, this one would capture them. And to ensure that, we've used as large a wood as possible. So in here, we've used, you know, full-size sort of lengths of tree. They're all cut from around here. They're all cut from trees that we've identified as not of high ecological interest and essentially they're stacked so that water can pass through but it's slowed on its way down to the river and as you can see behind water starts to pool and then sediments will build up and drop out behind it and that's really important for the river lug in particular because the lug is suffering with excess nutrients and that's where those excess nutrients are found is in those sediments that's making its way into our watercourses so by creating these structures that begin to capture debris and sediments over time, we can stop the amount of sediments and debris reaching the rivers. So a lot of people seem to think that leaky woody debris or leaky dams might in fact add debris to our watercourses, but what we're finding and with the landowners we work with is that actually they're reducing the amount of debris that's making it to culverts, bridges, and into sort of problem areas on the river that do need to stay clear. So, and then how does that example of a leaky dam compare with what's behind you there? Yeah, or so, this bit that we're on here. Yeah, so what we have above here is, is essentially, you know, it doesn't resemble a dam whatsoever. It's literally just branches laid across the floor. And that's because we get overland flows here. So water doesn't regularly flow that here, but you can see we had a heavy, uh, heavy amount of rain over the weekend. It is still slowly flowing down through here. And since placing these here a couple of months ago, they've managed to capture quite a lot of debris and sediment that was passing down this hill. And by doing that, we're keeping the soil and the nutrients on the land and saving them from entering the watercourse. So there really are many different kinds of leaky dams or natural flood management you can do depending on where you're working. Over to our left here, this just looks like a big mess of branches in the river. This is something we call gully stuffing. And that is actually laying lots of woody material into the watercourse in a tight ravine like it is there that wouldn't be appropriate to dam. There we're laying them on top of each other, on top of each other. Some of them are even pleached in, so there'll be living structures in there. And it just creates this complexity in the watercourse. Water has got to slowly work its way through all that detritus. That'll break down over time. As wood breaks down in the watercourse, it's also a part of the nutrient cycling as well. So that's also really important. But it's just created a really dense mat of habitat there as well. You can imagine in time things nesting in that because that's, that's such fantastic cover that just wouldn't be left there otherwise. Whoop. 
I'm definitely going to fall in oh, at some yeah, point some today. Point, yeah. Right, so how do you make a leaky dam? So we are about to construct a leaky dam or leaky woody debris. So I came here yesterday and prepped some timber for us. So I chainsawed some of the branches off of this tree here. So this tree will live on for many years to come. We've just taken a little weight out of the bottom. And then we've also coppiced some of the hazel stools up there that were kind of in need of a coppice anyway. So we got wood available right from site. It's hard wood, so it's going to take a long time to break down, which is also quite important when it comes to these. You wouldn't really want to be using spruce or anything too soft because it'll just break down too fast. So yeah, you want to use it from as close to site as possible. Ideally, you don't really want to bring any material onto site. So I prepped these in some sort of lengths with this area in mind, and we're going to have a go at sort of putting the pieces of the puzzle together. And, and that's it, you mentioned it there, puzzles. So that is that the idea is that, do you have any kind of, um, would you put in bigger stuff first? So like maybe like, a, like an anchor type thing first, or do, does it matter? Is it more a case of filling the shape? Exactly first? that, you're sort of looking at the shape you have. So I've got a couple of like, uh, like really sort of like arched and bent branches that should sit down in this dip quite nicely. But you also alluded to it there. You kind of want some of the bigger, heavier material at the bottom because that's more likely to stay in place. Mm. Now we try and generally use sort of landscape features to pin against. We're actually pretty limited here in that we don't really have a tree or anything or a large rock we can pin off of. So instead we're really gonna rely on the weight of the wood sitting in the shape and then sort of crisscrossing the pieces on top so that they're all kind of pinning one another down. Yeah, and I suppose in a way weaving to a degree so that they're holding themselves in because they end up as exactly one. Exactly that, yeah. yeah. We kind of want to want the whole thing to be one unit rather than sort of independent pieces that could come yeah. loose and yeah. move downstream. So and, yeah, they all does, sort of... Does that come, sorry to interrupt, does that come with um, then, I see some, we've got some smaller bits and there's mm -hmm. some other bits and pe smaller bits. Do you, you would then like fill in smaller bits at the end? It sort of depends on some, is... some of them you look at and you just think it doesn't really need it and it'll sort of just capture smaller stuff as it comes down in the water course. But in other dams, yeah, it sometimes is quite nice to take sort of some of the nice bendy pieces of hazel and like you say, kind of weave them some of, through some of the gaps. You might finish it and, and decide, oh, it's a little, little too gappy on the right there. Let's see if we can weave some stuff through there and just, you know, just by keeping it leaky but closing the gaps up a little bit, you're just allowing less of the sediment and the debris and leaves and things to pass through it. So right. the tighter you make it, the more of that stuff you're going to hold back. And depending on where you're doing it, might influence how much you want that to happen. So in the case of this right here, it's a really small water course. It actually dries up entirely in the summer. It's called an ephemeral stream. So we don't deal with huge amounts of water here, but it is really flashy. So after we've had a really heavy rain event, it does come down here quite forcefully. So they need to be strong but they don't need to be so much a dam as to hold everything back and create huge pools. We're just trying to slow it off here. Okay, right, so <laughs> should we get started? Let's get to it, yeah. So one of the things in certain streams, you don't want to block off that base flow at all in case there were migrating fish mm -hmm. so that they could still pass upstream. In the case of this water course, because I explained it's ephemeral, it's not actually a concern, doesn't hold any fish um, because it dries up entirely, but that is something to consider. Yeah. Would this be considered as a small leaky dam? And then how big can they get? Yeah, I mean, I'd call this probably medium sized in that the, the timber is of a relative sort of size and weight. Um, it's not impounding a huge amount of water, but it is gonna be a strong structure. So I'd say this, this sits somewhere in the middle. And you mentioned, I know that you've done some in the past where you've used bigger machinery to be able to take down trees. What yeah, would be the reason to do and, that? Yeah, so in certain sites, so we've actually done some on the actual main body of the river itself. And in the case of that, because it is so much more water and there's so much more risk in regards to actually backing up water and causing flooding, we're using, you know, things like winches to get trees into certain places where they're A, lodged and they can't become loose and, and move downstream. So that's really important from the safety side of things. But also we're not trying to like hold back the water there as much as we're trying to add complexity to it. So it, it might not slow the water down as much as a structure like this, but you have to consider other safety elements when it comes to the river itself. And, you know, we're really not trying to, you know, really you wouldn't want to go too far down the river. We really focus on doing this as high up in the catchment as you can. Right. That's where you've got the most opportunity. Yeah. 
because where we are right now, this is the River Lug. This is River Lug behind yeah. us, yeah. So I suppose just situate us to people that might not know where we are. Yeah, yeah, so we're on uh, Pentoyne Farm, uh, sort of northeastern Radnorshire, mid Wales. Uh, this is the River Lug Triple SI behind us. And we're about just under two miles from the source here. Um, it starts up on the hill behind us. So, you know, we are one of the first properties that the River Lug flows through, essentially. Um, so we're really well positioned to, to do our bit for the lug. Brilliant. You know, recently a scientific paper has kind of proved, you know, what we've kind of anecdotally known about these structures is that they are used by wildlife in the sense that they are sometimes used as bridges across watercourses. They're also used as refuge. Things like dippers will sit on them to feed from the watercourse. And there's recently been a paper out that has that's shown exactly that. So that's been really nice sort of confirmation of what we kind of anecdotally knew anyway. I've never really thought about referring to it as weaving, but I, I kind of like in log weaving as maybe another term for this. You know, that's what I'm seeing this as yeah, very yeah. much. Again, and that's your that's perspective what, like, coming in, which is really Doing a lot more, especially with the like random weave and then sculptural because I'm not trying not to use glues and things yeah. or nails and stuff like that. It's how can I make the thing hold itself together? I've seen some people that do use wire and nails and different tools in this. Again, certain like in, in certain aspects that might be necessary or certain areas that might be necessary. But so far on this project, I haven't had to use any external materials at all. And that's always kind of the aim because if anything is to come loose, that's then in, in the water course, essentially. You yeah, know? yeah, exactly. Right, so are we done? I mean, I'm pretty happy more? with that. That is gonna capture a lot of smaller stuff as it comes down. We haven't left any large gaps in that. You can already even see that the water is quite slowed down. Mm -hmm. Does it encourage any kinds of habitat, insects, nature? Yeah, exactly. So like you've seen on the other one, you, you tend to, over time, as it builds up, you get a sort of little pool behind. Mm -hmm. So that'll create more available water for invertebrates and other species, especially coming into the drier periods, you know, where that would have run dry really fast previously because it was just running off. Now that pool will be there for a little longer, even if it's only a few days extra, that's a few days extra available water for wildlife and livestock, you know, because we have free roaming livestock here as well that do use these water courses to drink from as well. So they're very much multifunctional structures and that's kind of the beauty of them. They work for so many things, you know, so when we're approaching landowners and farmers, we're not just talking about the natural flood management benefit for someone downstream. We're talking about what it's going to do for their land, what it's going to do for their farm business, their livestock and these sorts of things. Brilliant. Well, that's an interesting point and yep. I won't ask you that here. We're going to go to a different site. Yep. that's a slightly different example of some leaky dams to talk about why. What's the reason to put in a leaky dam? Yeah, yeah. come to a new site to look at a different example of a leaky dam. So I suppose, yeah, just take me through what is this type of leaky dam, how it differs, and what's the reason of having something like this? Yeah, so like I was saying before, different sites kind of dictate like how you're going to create the leaky dam. And what we're actually trying to do here is influence it during flood to actually reconnect with the floodplain wetlands adjacent to it. So all of the trees here are angled towards the wetlands so that the water will rise and push out of the bank that way and, and sort of re-engage re with the floodplain. So here we use as big a material as possible and we try and pin material using other trees. So in the case of this tree here, we've actually pleached this tree. It's still very much alive, sat down in the river and then felled another tree directly on top of it. We'll probably do some supplementary planting here as well. Yeah. Uh, just so that there's more material for the future. Some alders, some willows. Just every site needs something different. And I'm really happy with this site in regards to it looking quite natural. Mm. This, if you've spent any time around beaver territory or just seen areas where there's been natural tree failure and it hasn't been cleared up, this tends to be something what it looks like. Yeah. And it just creates a more dynamic river system. 
So developing on that, we say about the why, what, why mm. to do something like this. I suppose this would be a good time now to introduce us into yeah, the project itself, who you work for and obviously what it is that you're doing and with the leaky dams being a part of that yep. project. Yeah, so I run the Wilder Lug project, uh, which is run by Radnorshire Wildlife Trust. So I work specifically on the upper lug within Radnorshire in, in mid Wales, um, but the lug passes through then into Herefordshire and joins the River Wye, uh, just south of Hereford. Um, so there's, there's a few you know, key objectives to this project, but one of the key ones is natural flood management. And so leaky dams are a huge part of that. There are other things that are a part of that, such as tree planting, such as pond and wetland creation, mm -hmm. scrapes, erosion control. But really this sort of, the leaky dams kind of do a lot of things in one. They're very multifunctional. Not only can we help reduce the, the pulse of, you know, flood water, but we can also create that complexity in the watercourse that has, that has been missing for so long and maybe re-engage floodplains that have become disconnected because of embankment or, or drainage. And so they can do a lot of different things and each site kind of requires something different and, and, and lends itself to one objective more than the other. And that's what I really like about them actually. You can kind of, you know, depending on the requirements of the landowner, the landscape, you can kind of chop and change as you need. So. So yeah, the other side of it is habitat creation. You know, that's a huge part of the project. And again, these do that. They create more diversity and structure in, in the catchment across the river. You know, there's now been- I'm really sorry, I just want to pause you. Echo oh. is out of shot and she's got across the river and she's struggling to get back. Oh, uh, she made it over the bridge. Okay, so I've been looking every so often because I, I, when we <laughs> first started talking, I was like, how has the dog got across the stream? <laughs> and I'm like, am I going to have to jump up and go and save her? <laughs> no, she's back. A good girl. Yes. Yeah, you made it back. Well done. <laughs> yes, good girl. Sorry. I, I apologise. Um, That's all right. Yeah, so, so just, yeah. yeah, habitat creation, really. Like, they, they, do, they do exactly that as well, you know. In a lot of places, they're creating that diversity, that 3D structure in the, in the river. So, you know, you've got all these layers that could be nesting habitat. There's now scientific proof that they are used as wildlife bridges in the UK. My job is made easy by the fact that natural flood management almost always has a positive impact on, on wildlife if you take into consideration the site and all the sort of factors there are in where you're working. Yeah. So where can people find, if they want to find more information, I guess about the project, but would yep. there be relevant information that's sort of joined to that that's maybe relevant to my you know a river or stream that's near them if obviously they may not be yeah sort of located around the lug that's a really that's a really good question because natural flood management is is still quite a new practice really it is now at the point where just about every river catchment across the uk does have natural flood management projects or will certainly be making this a part of their management so i'd suggest you know if you're in this part of the country if you're in mid wales Radnorshire Wildlife Trust has two different river projects. Natural Resources Wales has projects on the Y as well as other organisations. But I would urge you to look wherever you are in the country, look to your local wildlife trusts, your local rivers trusts, and also look to the, the actual water companies and the, the regulatory bodies as well, because it's likely that they will be doing something. And then I suppose, yeah, just to end, just to tie it into, so partly why I asked Dan to come and do this today is uh, I, worked for the wildlife trust i did a project for them about the lug but it was following me contacting them because i contacted them alongside other sort of similar organizations that i want to work with and that was part of that original chat in doing the introduction i was like well i'd like to do a video if, you, if you're up for it to do a tutorial for yeah. for my channel and we might do a few more as because the project is it a two-year project it's uh it's now two and a half years total right. yeah so yeah, we might do some more. So if you're interested in learning more very specifically about the log, then I'll leave a link to the video at the end. Otherwise, thanks Dan. I'm gonna clean Echo off now. And uh, thanks everyone. And I'll see you in the next one. <laughs>